Hello, I am Maddie White, a reporter at Global Trade Review. Since the start of the year, the shipping industry has found itself facing challenges and changes. GTR has reported that port restrictions have been imposed because of the pandemic, regulators have tried some sanctions controls, and maritime tech is increasingly being used to locate ships' whereabouts. In this 30-minute discussion, I'm thrilled to be joined by Guy Platten, Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping, to discuss how the shipping business is faring and its future. So Guy, earlier in the year, every country seemed to have its own set of rules when it came to port and travel restrictions. What impact did this have on the shipping industry? Well, thanks, uh, Maddie. It's a, a real honour and a privilege to, uh, to come and speak to you today and to be part of this. So, uh, really, we've been uh, here at International Chamber Shipping, we've been sort of monitoring the effects of this pandemic right from the beginning of the year when it hit China and that having a big impact on global shipping there as factories shut down. And then we just saw it gradually spread throughout the world. But from about mid March, essentially, nations shut down completely, travel restrictions were imposed. And that put us, it was, it, was, it was such a way from the new normal. So we've had ships which have continued to sail, continue to deliver the vital food, the fuel, the medical supplies around the world. But what we found it really difficult is it managing to get our crews off the ship and get them relieved. So a lot of them now spend a huge amount of extra time on board the ship because they just can't get off and get relieved. And we're now estimating about 300,000 seafarers out of 1.2 million are stuck on board their ships and they can't get home. And this has been an absolutely uh, humanitarian crisis. And it's, and it's been so frustrating for us as an industry because it, it means safety is implicated and, and all sorts of things as a result of the fatigue issues that's going on with this. And so it's been a, a real issue since, since the middle of March. And, and it really, after six months, it hasn't got any better. And we're still in the same situation and we're finding that nations that countries are not prioritizing crew as they should do making them essential workers and allowing them to, to travel so it's been a huge issue for us okay no definitely um so restrictions are still very much in place in some areas for example india and with cases rising across europe measures could definitely tighten again um Tell us about how the shipping industry is tackling travel and port restrictions in places like India and how it might deal with a second round of lockdowns if that happens. Well, we, we've been making our case very loudly in, in you see it in, across the media. We've been lobbying the United Nations, the international maritime organizations. We've been lobbying individual governments to make sure they classify Syria as a key workers. We all absolutely applaud the healthcare workers, the frontline healthcare workers. Seafarers are no different. If it wasn't for the seafarers, we wouldn't get the supplies in and out of country. So that's the essential bit. So we've been working very, very hard to make sure that's the case. Uh, it comes to India and other countries, particularly the major labor supply countries, and India is one, is being able to lobby and persuade the governments that seafarers are a special class of people in the sense that we need them to keep the supply lanes running. So we've been putting in place all sorts of protocols and procedures to make sure that we minimize the risk to public health and we minimize the risk to the seafarers. So through our, our United Nations body, the International Maritime Organizations, we put in place a 12-step protocols, which covers the journey of the seafarer from his home to the ship and back to the home again, with all sorts of precautions in terms of testing and quarantine and all these things to make sure it's done in a safe way possible. So We've been working hard, but you're right. The frustration is as countries are reimposing some restrictions, yeah. but they're not looking at the bigger picture in terms of seafarers. I mean, it does feel sometimes that the shipping industry, seafarers in particular, are collateral damage. We had a, 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 a earlier this week, we, we had our own little, uh, we had some a webinar with Guy Ryder, who's the Director General of the International Labour Organization. And he said something quite, I thought was quite telling was that the international the nations have not looked out for their international obligations during this pandemic they focus on the national interests and, and and that has been lost in this this now everyone's focused on the here and now and their own populations rather than looking at the bigger picture and making sure that the, the global the international nature is and their obligations are fulfilled so it's, it's been a really frustrating time over the last six months 
but we're fighting hard for, uh, for our workforce and we'll continue to do so until people see that it's the right thing to do. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, when it comes to goods, there is talk of diversifying and or shortening supply chains where possible to reduce the risk of non-delivery. Will this impact the shipping business? It's difficult to tell really. At the moment, we're still in the midst of this pandemic. Um, we saw, as I suppose countries shut down and factories shut down, there was a disruption to world trade, but actually that's starting to ease off now. The difficulty is that actually the travel restrictions is there. But there's no doubt that countries are going to look at their supply chains, their supply lines. I think that's exposing things over the coming, you know, over the coming years. Shipping will always adapt to whatever the situation is. But I think it's what is really important is um, we don't lose sight of the fact that trade and international trade is vital. Uh, you know, the, although we are not a knockers of globalization, actually the movement of goods in, around the world has lifted so many people out of poverty that what we don't want is countries just centering them upon themselves and, you know, and, and doing things which actually are, are sort of protectionist in their nature because they think that's what they need to do. But actually we need to continue to make the case for international trade and an international rules-based order. The US and UK regulator, regulators um, have tightened sanctions controls on maritime trade this year. How is this affecting shipping? Well, I think every shipping company will always try to obey the international rules in terms of whether it's in sanctions. It's, it's not having the effect you, you'd think necessarily because actually shipping just moves to where you can move goods and services. That's shipping as a, a mobile asset by its nature, so it can do. But, but clearly what we don't want to see, there's, there's a difference between sanctions, which is a political tool against a regime, to protectionism, which is actually you know, trying to uh, protect their own trade at the expense of others. And that's, I think, what to me is a really worrying development as, as we go on. We've seen geopolitically that different countries are all, to a lesser or greater degree, moving down this route. And that's something that we need to, 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 to speak up against. Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, in August, GTR reported that US authorities seized Iranian oil from four tankers that were going to Venezuela in an attempt to defy US sanctions. Has the kind of disruption caused by the pandemic provided an opportunity, do you think, for this kind of activity? Have more ships been evading sanctions? I, I couldn't give you an answer on that one. I, you know, uh, it's, it's a very small part of the market, if that's the case, because actually ships have to comply with international regulations and international rules. And they do so, you know, that's why we have the International Maritime Organization. So things like that is, 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 a, is a very small part of what's going on. You know, the vast majority of, of ship owners will obey the rules which are in place in terms of who can ship what to where. Sure. Um, do you think there is an increased need for maritime technology? And do you think we will see kind of a higher adoption among financial institutions? We'll Given that they need to be kind of wary about what's going on at sea, we see that increasingly. The, um, the, the, the there's various products out there now, which now keeps it in real time monitors where the positions of ships are. I think that will only ever increase. On you know, not just for, for that, but also from safety and other type of stuff. We we've definitely seen through this pandemic a a, a, a more accelerated move towards digitalisation, um, in, in terms of that, in terms of shipping. I think that trend will only, you know, we've all seen it in our everyday lives, you know, we're having this conversation by, by Zoom, you know, remotely. So we can see that it's really starting to affect the industry as well. So those technological changes are happening, were happening already, but now they've been accelerated uh, as, as a result. But things like in terms of monitoring sanctions and, and, and other things, that was in place before, as th th that will no doubt increase as the years, you know, the time goes on. Okay. Um... What is the kind of outlook for the shipping industry in the next 12 months, say? Well, I think it depends. I mean, shipping is, 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 is difficult to define in the sense it's got different sectors. So if we look at the cruise ship industry, <clears throat> I mean, that's been decimated by the pandemic. You know, effectively, cruise operations are shut in most companies until probably next March. There's a few limited savings going on. So that part of the industry is really heavily affected by this. Other parts we've seen there was a, 
initial downturn, for example, they contend that we now, uh, I think that last month, we we're only 3% below where it was this time last year. The, and the bulk trade as well, which is that's iron ore and, and grain and things like that, you know, that's very quite cyclical as well. So it's, it's it, and the offshore industry is being affected by, by all of this, and that's partly a reduction of demand for oil. So these things tend to go in cycles, and I think it depends which sector you talk about as to what the outlook is for the, for the next year, which sounds a very wishy-washy answer, but, but some sectors will do better than others. I'll give you an example. Early this year, when there was a, basically an oil glut because no one was burning oil because of their, all the economies had shut down, um, that they were tankers were being chartered at the rate of $250,000 a day because you've got to store this stuff somewhere. I think two days ago, the same tanker was $10,000 a day. So, it, you know, it is very, very cyclical and depends what's going on in the world. We're just a reflection of what's happening in the world trade as a whole. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, is there anything else that you think is kind of important to mention about the shipping industry or anything that's kind of going on? I think the shipping industry, basically, we, 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 we see ourselves as the, the, the engine that moves the world trade. You know, we, that's so necessary. So we're always reflecting what's going on in the world. And I think our fears are, uh, and, you know, that's the heart of what you do in terms of global trade review, is, is what's going to happen. And I think that's the unknown question, really. That's the, the, the six million dollar question that we need to, to be answered. As we move through this, how will our economies open up again? How will they recover? And how will that impact affect world trade? Will supply lines be reduced or will we go back to a, a, you know much as it was before? That's what we're looking out for and what we're focusing on as an industry. And then you put on top of that, the green agenda, the need to decarbonize, the need to reduce greenhouse gas uh, um, uh, emissions, the shipping industry is going to go through some very interesting, very challenging times in the next few years. Sure. And with this kind of sustainability agenda, how do you think the shipping industry could um, adapt to it? So we, we, we set ourselves as an industry very ambitious targets through the International Maritime Organization, which is effectively to cut our CO2 emissions, our greenhouse gas emissions, by 50% in real terms by 2050. Now, to get some perspective on that, I mean, the population of the world is growing, trade grows, and, you know, we just put this year to one side, but the, the, the trend is to grow. So usually that means more ships. So we're gonna have more ships, but 50% less emissions. And that effectively means we've got to introduce into the, to the fleet zero carbon fuel chips by the early 2030s, which is only 10 years away. And we still haven't centered on what is going to be that zero carbon fuel chip. So it's massive change is going to come over the next few years. It's going to be huge. And that is no doubt going to impact on the whole trade outlook as well. So what are kind of the main challenges you think the shipping industry is facing right now? So I think our, our biggest one is getting through this crisis, COVID crisis. There's no doubt what's the absolute top of every single ship owner's ship operators list at the moment is, is the crew change issue. You know, with, with uh, on an, there's about 1.2 million seafarers serving on board ships at any one time. It's about the equivalent to the population of Cyprus. Normally on a month by month basis, 100,000 of those, those seafarers will leave their ships and go home. And 100,000 seafarers will leave their homes to refuel the ships to, so, so the crews are fresh. Since the middle of March, essentially that has stopped and we all slowed right down. And we reckon we're only getting about 25 to 30% of the required crew changes going. And of course, this is cumulative. So now we, we estimate over 300,000 seafarers are well beyond their contracts. Normally seafarers will do anything between a couple of months to, to 11 months on a, on a ship. But we've had some reports of seafarers doing 17, 18 months now aboard the ship. And if you think of the human cost of that, can you imagine being away from your family for 18 months, not seeing your children? Um, can you imagine working continuously seven days a week for 18 months without any sort of break? And that effect that has on your, your mental health and your fatigue issues. We've got seafarers who, who have not seen their family. They, they've missed the birth of their children. They've missed, sadly, the passing of loved ones, not being able to go to the funerals. We, it's, it's, it's that human toll which has happened and we, we get it on a daily basis, we see how, and, and 
And I think the frustration for us is persuading governments to allow them to get off the ship, you know, to ease the travel restrictions for, for, for seafarers, and classify them as essential workers and allow them to, to go home um, and to get the fresh ones out. So and it, and it plays out in two ways, because of course you've got the people aboard the ship who are tired, and then you've got seafarers who've got no means of income because they're meant to be on board the ship. And, and it's a lot of, sort of labor supply countries like um, India and the Philippines and Indonesia you know, Myanmar and other places which, you know, form a lot of part of the, the ship's crews from around the world, of course, but they do. And, and often the seafarers, which is a, a relatively well-paid profession, particularly in these countries, and they often support a wide network of family. They're not able to provide that support. So it's, it's a real human tragedy. And I think the frustration for, for us as industry can be so easily solved. If governments have to do to do so. And, and, and that's what we are lobbying really hard and, and to make crew changes an absolute priority. So what's troubling me at the moment, that is the only thing. That's the one thing that is, consumes most of my day in terms of lobbying and, 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 and working hard to try and get the solutions in place. And then I think it's then moving beyond this, this, this crisis, making sure that never allowed to happen again. And then it's the whole issue is getting back to normal and stabilizing trade and, and all these things. So that there's, a, there's a huge agenda ahead of us, but the one thing troubling us now, it's crew changes. Yeah, I guess it kind of um, requires an international corporation because you have different governments wanting to do different things. So I guess there's that element of it, which makes it really difficult. It is, it, it's, it, you're right. I mean, what has been superb is it's been unparalleled levels of cooperation between the international bodies. So from the employer side, from our side, International Chamber of Shipping, we work very closely with the International Transport Federation, International Transport Workers Federation, the ITF, um, who represent all the, the workers, the, the, the transport workers around the world, that are sort of the union, the social partners, with the international bodies like the International Maritime Organization, the International Labour Organization, the World Health Organization, um, and the United Nations as a whole, which is sort of, you know, these are agencies of that. I, I have calls probably on a daily basis with all these different agencies and, and with the social partners. So that's been great. The trouble is, is that national governments have not lived up to their international responsibilities. And, 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 and that's been the frustration. And, it, and it's been really hard to get that cut through because what we've done is we've just carried on doing our job, which is to move goods. So until that stops, will they actually do anything? Mm. And I know you do wonder sometimes if that was to stop, whether actually that's the only thing that will actually force governments into, into actually taking action. But provided we carry on doing stuff that they'll, they, you know, it's, it's in a all too difficult to solve box. That's what we feel. And that, that sense of frustration that we have is palpable amongst all my colleagues um, as we, we do our best. We've had so much media, support and attention but it's still it's getting that cut through uh, and, it, and it needs the heads of government to actually speak to other heads of government and say this can be solved it can be solved tomorrow if there was a political will to do so and i think that's that's our real frustration okay um obviously that's a, a major challenge you're facing is there any kind of opportunities as well that you think um has opened up I think it's been some really, you know, positive things. Like in any crisis, there's positive things come out of it because we all learn to adapt very quickly. And that's, that's why it's about being a human being. We, we, we react to crises and, and you see, and, and, you know, I talked about the high levels of cooperation between the agencies. That's going to continue. That, you know, those relationships have been formed now. That, that's not going to go away. And that all goes well if we look at our next challenge, which is decarbonisation, because we've got that, that level of cooperation now, that, that that suspicions, if there were any before, have gone because we trust each other to to actually to tackle this next problem. So I think there's positives there. There's certainly positives in some of the things we've talked about for years in terms of digitalization of certificates and surveys. That's been accelerated because actually when needs must be found that we could do it that way, and actually it worked. So I think there's some real um, some leaps forward that's been done on that side of it as well. Um, I, I think that's been a, a really good outcome of it, uh, of all of this. 
I'm sure other industries have found the same and, 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 and will adapt accordingly. But so there's some, there is some positives to come out of this. Uh, and, and that gives me hope for the future as well for our industry. Um, we are a resilient industry. We are a people-based industry, always have been, always will be. And I think enhancing that level of cooperation has been a, a, been a good thing. Mm. Okay. Um, you've mentioned digitization a bit. From an outside point of view, it's quite difficult to know what's going on. Um, so I'm just wondering how is the shipping industry being impacted by digitalization and what's kind of happening? We know about that ships are being tracked more, but kind of could you give us some insight on that? Um, so uh, when, I, when I talk about that, it's, it's a lot of um, shipping that has been traditionally based on sort of paper-based work. And now that's just gone all online now. Certificates have done it. That, that's, that's you know what I mean by that. There's a lot more automation now on board ships, a lot more monitoring that you can do on board ships, which is just being accelerated because it had to. Um, before, there was lots of physical surveys of ships being done to make sure they comply. We can do an awful lot of that remotely now without coming on board. So these things save time for the ship's crew, save time for, for, for other people, and will save money. So it's, it's not just about tracking, it's about the whole uh, business of trade, really. Um, we've been we're quite a traditional, you know, industry in some ways, progressive in other ways, and that is because we've had to to, to get all these um, certificates put online and done all that. That's 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 worked very quickly. And of course, you then why would you ever go back to the old way of doing things? So I think that's been uh, been been really positive uh, going forward. Hmm. So long term, we've got digitisation and sustainability high on the agenda. Is there anything else? Well, I think the, 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 I think the biggest challenge, of course, as, as we mentioned before, is I think the decarbonisation of the industry. Um, to you know, we are, are very, very ambitious. I think if if you can park COVID nineteen to one side, that's the biggest single issue uh, which is affecting the industry now. Is how on earth do we move from a, a, a shipping industry which predominantly burns oil? fossil fuels to one which burns zero carbon fuels. And then you look at the implications of that. So um, fuel, the reason why like oil is so good, it's very, very calorific intensive. You get much more energy for your, for your, for, for your buck really in terms of the, the, the volume of fuel that you consume. Um, and, and that's why oil is, has been such a phenomenal success in driving world economies and driving industry. And then to move away from that, so uh, I'll give you an example. If we move to one of the fuels that's being touted, which is um, carbon free, is ammonia. So that, that potentially a fuel for the future. Now, ammonia has got massive safety implications. It's hugely toxic. If you, were to, if you do it, inhale ammonia, you, you're probably going to be dead. So it has these massive safety concerns, which you have to control. And that can be controlled through, through, through that. But actually, ammonia is only one fifth as calorific as oil. So for every one tonne of oil you consume, you need to consume five tonnes of ammonia. Now, every year as an industry, we consume something like 300 million tonnes of oil. So we would need to have one and a half billion tonnes of ammonia. Now you think that through, where are you going to get that ammonia from in a sustainable manner? How are you going to store it? And how are you going to say to put it on board the ships? That's huge logistical problems, which will affect, um, affect the entire supply chain. And we, we're starting to grapple with that now. Not only that, we haven't got 50 years to do that. So the transition in our industry from sail to steam, which is sort of coal power to oil, happened over 100 plus years. So I think the last sailing ship, a commercial sailing ship in terms of cargo was in the, the 1930s. Yet steam trips around from the 1830s. So it's taken that long, and then the shift to oil accelerated. But now we've got to actually go from eventually fossil burning ships to zero carbon fuel ships. We've got 10 years. So we've got to, we've got to narrow 100 years down to 10 years. And that's a massive challenge um, for, for the industry. Um, and I think the implications for the consumer, for trade, is that's a requirement we've got to do. That is going to cost money. And someone ultimately is going to have to pay for that. And I think what there's that education thing we've got to do with, with consumers and with, with populations around the world is that 
it's going to cost more moving forward. Do you think it's possible then? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. We, we, I wouldn't be standing here and sitting here if it wasn't. We're very excited about it. We think it is anything possible. We're, we're up for it. We believe it can happen. It just, but, it, but the only way it's going to happen, and this is why I think the, the, the lessons of COVID have been good, the only way it's going to happen is everybody cooperates and everyone has a shared objective and a shared goal. You can't just leave the shipping industry to sort out. You've got to have the entire supply chain, and that's, you know, your trade. You know, that's, that's it needs that whole that whole piece, everyone to come together to be able to solve this bit. Is it solvable? Absolutely it is. We know there's zero carbon fuel, that you can get hydrogen fuel cars and ammonia fuel cars and you get battery powered chips for, for small routes and things like that. So we know the technology is, is able, but it's going to be then scaled up now. I mean, if you look at a, a big container ship, just the size of that, it, you know, some of the ships will carry 22,000 containers. Now you can imagine how you could then convert that to have zero carbon fuel. It's, it's, it's immense in terms of storage and all these other type things. And the design of the ships is going to change fundamentally. So we, we call it in the ICS the fourth, we've heard of the fourth industrial revolution. We'd say this is the fourth propulsion revolution as we, we, we actually as a society shift from fossil fuels to zero carbon fuel ships. I, I just wonder whether in 20 or 30 years time we look back on this era of Fossil fuels thinking, gosh, that was quite quaint, wasn't it? But now it's, it's something that we're absolutely focused on. Um, I think the COVID-19 is, I suppose, what they call a black swan event. You know, one in a hundred years. It took everyone by surprise and, and we'll learn less from it. But actually, climate change is real. And we have to focus on the solutions for that as well. No, certainly. Well, thank you very much for your time, Guy. Really appreciate your insights and it was very interesting speaking to you. You're very welcome, Abby. Thank you very much for the invitation.